Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. So glad that you are here. To those who are watching us online, out in our courtyard, or at Discovery Northwest Campus, so excited that you are here. Make some noise if you're excited to hear the Word of God today. Come on, Discovery. As we jump into the Word today, I got a question for you. Have you ever received a word from God? Like, have you ever, maybe it was during like a worship experience, during a song, you just felt like God spoke to you? Maybe it was during a message or a conference or, or maybe even during your quiet time, you just felt like a Holy Spirit whisper into your soul and you got a word from God. I'm telling you, God does want to speak to you. How many of you believe that? Like God wants to speak to you and sometimes he'll give us a word. Like last Sunday, let me give you a couple examples. Last Sunday, I heard this story. This guy came to me and said, Pastor Jason, I don't know if you know, but last Sunday changed my life. I was actually ready to separate move out of the, the house with my, with my wife. I got the apartment, got the keys. We came to church together, and God did a miracle. He said, we figured out that we were going through tribulation without hope, but God filled us with new hope to get through this. I canceled it, turned in my key. We're moving back, and God's healing our heart. They got a word from God in the middle of that. There was another person from Justice last week that said, I thought I was hoping the right way my whole life. I found out I was hoping wrong. I was hoping the wrong thing. And it's the reason why my heart is sick is because I have the wrong hope. That was like a word that they received in the middle of, now God will give you like a, there's a public and a public worship or in a public preaching or teaching. You can get a word, but there's also a time where God can give you like an individual word. where You can get a, like a word from God or sometimes even from, from others. I remember when Pastor Veronica and I were in a transition season and, and the Lord had told us, he had spoken to us, like, that we were going to plant a church and start a new church. And we didn't know how, when, or where. But we, we, so we were in this transition season of trying to find a home, a home church. We stepped out and we're just like, okay, God, don't, don't, don't know what that looks like. So we actually find ourselves at Cornerstone, which is now Lifehouse Church in, in North Bakersfield. And I remember we attended a Wednesday night service. Pastor Veronica and I sat in the back just to check it out and discern. And as the pastor was speaking, he kept looking at me. How many of you feel like I'm looking at you and I keep looking at you and stuff? Like he kept looking at me. I'm like, dang it, he, he knows something, right? And right after the sermon, he came beeline for me in the back of the church. I'm like, what is this guy doing? He comes and he, and he points at me. He says, I see you got a calling on your life, don't you? Are you a pastor? And I said, yeah, yeah, I am. And I was just was coming to check it out. And, and so we get to talking and, and stuff. And he tells me this. He says, I see that you are a Joseph. There's a kingdom living inside of you. And that's what he prophesies in, in, into me. And then through our conversation, he actually invites me. He says, I, I want you to preach this Sunday. I believe you have a word, which I did. God gave me a word, and I've written out a word, a sermon. I didn't know when it was going to come, but it was actually just the previous day. I, read, I didn't know where it was going to manifest. And he says, I believe you got a word. You Preach this Sunday. At the 11 o'clock service, they had like a Spanish service and an English service back then, Lifehouse did. And he said, come preach the English service. And I'm like, I, okay, yeah, let's, let's do this, amen. And at the end of the conversation, he, he's like, oh, and, and by the way, what was your name again? I was like, I'm preaching at your church this Sunday. I'm Jason Hannes, so this is going to go great. This is gonna go. So, but there's words that I have received along the, the, the journey, and then maybe there's some words that you have received along the journey too that were like, like I have, that you were like a check in your spirit happened. You're like, uh, I don't know about that one, right? Have you ever received a word or someone tried to give you a word and you're just like, well, I'm not sure if that one kind of fits. Here's why I'm asking uh, this question and why I want you to think like this is because Joseph received a word from God. It came in the form of a dream, but that word he got from God did not look like it was the word of God all the way up until this point of the journey. It was contradictory to what the word was. It didn't look like the word. So if you judge a word that you got from God by the season that you're in, you may give up on the word that God has for you prematurely. So, so, so how do I know a word is from God. If I can't always see from the fruit of it, because sometimes it takes seasons and years for a word to come to pass, how do I know a word is from God or this dream is from God? Today is it's part six in this series, Dream to Destiny. Up to this point, the first five sermons were, were Joseph's life from he was 17 to 30 years old. And then here, this is gonna, today's going to act as a bridge because starting next week, we're going to study from Joseph's life from 30 years old on, from the time he steps into his destiny until he fulfills his destiny. I told you throughout the series that even though you step into your destiny, you're still tested by God. 
You still get tested to fulfill the destiny. And we'll study that. And we'll get back to doing this in chronological order here next week. But today, I'm gonna, this acts as a bridge because I want to summarize this journey that Joseph had to take. That he had a word from God that was not manifesting for years. From seven, 13 years, he saw no fruit of it. How do we know? This is called, today is called the prophetic test. The prophetic test. So, so the, the, the pro, pro, prophetic means to speak under divine inspiration. It means God has a spoken word for you. Maybe through a dream like Joseph or through maybe through your quiet time with the Lord, through an encounter time, or it may be through a friend or a pastor or a prophet. Most of the time, it's confirmed. His word is confirmed through multiple resources. In fact, that word, specific word, where someone said, I was Joseph or had the spirit of Joseph, had came in my life four other times. That has been spoken to me by men of God or pastors or prophets over, over my life. And it was just confirmed time and time again. Now, some words, some some of God's words for you are dependent upon you, and some are not. Meaning this, sometimes there's a word that God has for you, and it's going to come to pass no matter what. It's just going to come to pass, okay? God's word will come to pass. And there are other words that God has for you and will give you that are dependent upon how you respond to the testing that he's putting you through, okay? This is what we've seen through Joseph's life. It's called the prophetic test. You will go through this. You're going to go through this, and we'll get back in a chronological order, but I wanted to show you, because we're studying the life of Joseph, I want to show you this powerful psalm, this psalm that actually mentions Joseph and what we're talking about today. In Psalm 105, verse 17 through 19, let me show it to you. It says this, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, and they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in iron. So that's everything up to this point, these first 13 years. He was sold in slavery. He got thrown in prison. That, that's what we've been studying. Until, look at this, until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Now, I highlighted those two words, his word and the word. Although it's translated in many translations the same word, it's actually two different words in the Hebrew. The first time where it says until the time his word came to pass, that's the Hebrew word debar. Debar, and it means to speak or to declare, Okay? The second time it's mentioned is when it says the word, that is the Hebrew word imra, and it means the word of God, or the Torah, the word of God. So this is what we just read. Until the time that the spoken word over Joseph's life came to pass, the literal word tested him. Okay? This is similar to the, in, in Greek, if you've ever studied logos and rhema. A rhema word is a now word, revelation, spoken word. The logos word is the written word. What he's saying is that your word that you got will be tested by the word of God until it comes to fruition. Are you hearing me, you guys? Okay. So let me show it to you in the New Living Translation in Psalm 119, 105, verse 19. Let me show it in a different translation. It says this. Until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. This is what we've been talking about, these character tests. This is how God, testing means to refine, to prune, to purify the word that we are getting from God, whether it's from someone spoken over you or in your quiet. What do you do with that? What do we do with the word, the dream that God has given us? Okay, let me, let me show you what to do, what Joseph should have done and some of the instances he did do. Okay, here's the first thing. When you get a word from God, number one, you got to submit that word. I have to submit my word. So when I get a word from God, when I have vision, a dream, I, I, I talk to, the first one I talk about is my wife, Pastor Veronica. As I share it with her, God's revealing things to her and has already revealed things to her. As I share it with my pastoral elders and I share a word, I share the, the dream, I know when I share my word, it's not the whole word. There are other pieces that come together as we share the dream. So I gotta submit my word. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9 says, For we know in part, and we prophesy, we declare God's word in part. So let me ask you like this. Is there anyone who knows in full? Is there anyone besides God who knows everything? Absolutely not. So since you don't know everything, your prophetic word, that word that you held on to, it isn't 
everything. So I got to submit my word. See, prophetic words, when, you, when God speaks to you, those are, it's like pieces of a puzzle. But here's the problem with prophetic words. It's the human element, right? It's, the, it's, it's us. It's like, uh, uh, it's really not the word that's the problem. It's our understanding of the word. Or maybe it's, it's our, maybe our interpretation or misinterpretation of the word that God has given us. Um, you know, there wasn't anything wrong with the dream that God gave jo- uh, Joseph. The word that he gave him in the form of the dream, it was his understanding of the word that was immature, that was wrong. People say, well, God gave Joseph the dream that, he was, uh, uh, that his brothers bowed down to him. No, he did not. God did not give that dream to Joseph. God gave Joseph a dream that sheaves, his brother's sheaves, bowed down to his sheaf. God gave Joseph a dream, a word in the form of a dream, that the sun and the moon and stars bowed down to his. God did not give him a dream that they bowed down to him. The dream, here's what God gave him this word for, this dream. It was just to get him started on the test. The dream, what it did is it revealed his pride and immaturity in the way he processed, interpreted, and handled it went off and blabbered about it. Go watch part one of this message. Can you think about this? Mary, the mother of Jesus, she got a word from God. An angel, an angelic visitate gave gave her a word. You shall bear a son, and he will be the son of the most high, and he'll sit on the throne of David. He's going to be the savior of the world. She got a word from God. What did she do with it? You go read it. What she did? She pondered it in her heart. Can you imagine if Mary would have got that word and then ran out of there going, guess what, everybody? I'm going to have a son. It's going to be born. God actually is, my, is the daddy. That wouldn't, it, would not, it would not have gone well. It would, it would have revealed her immaturity and her pride, and she needed to go through some test. But she didn't. She, how did she respond, by the way, to the angel Gabriel? Do you remember how she responded? She, she said uh, to the angel Gabriel, she says, I'm the Lord's servant. May your word be fulfilled. May your rhema, what we're talking about here, may not the logos, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the written word, may your revelation word to me be fulfilled, and I'm going to ponder it in my heart. What'd she do? She submitted her word. She submitted it, okay? That's the first thing. If you got a word from God, which you, I hope you do, I hope you are getting words and God's speaking to you, you got to submit it. The second thing that you need to do is hold on to the word. I got to hold on to my word. Since my word will be tested by God, you're going to have to hold on tight, bro. You're, it's going to be tested even when it doesn't look like your word will come to pass. Even when they crucify your word. Even when they put your word in a tomb and it's dead. You serve the God who brings dead things back to life. You better hold on to your word. Even if they throw you in prison or in a pit, you hold on to the word that God gave you. You got to hold on tight. Philippians chapter three says this, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on, look what he says, and take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In other words, Jesus has a destination for every one of us. We're studying dream to destiny. You know in that word destiny, destination comes from that word destiny. God has a destination for every one of you. And if you don't know how to hold on to the word he's giving you, you ain't going to get there. You're not going to get from dream to destiny if you don't hold on. So do you believe in the spoken word that God has given you? I hope you do. God wants to lead you not just through the word, yes, but through a spoken word, through a, a word, a dream, a revelation. He wants to speak to you and lead you. When he does, you got to submit it, and you, you have to hold on to it. Let me give you an example. First Timothy chapter 1, Paul is talking to Timothy about exactly what we're talking about here. In verse 18 to 20, he says, Timothy, my son, now it's his spiritual son, not his real, but he's, he calls him son. He says, I'm giving you this command in keeping, look what it says, with the prophecies once made about you. There was a spoken word, Timothy, that was, that was over your life. There was an utterance of God that I'm reminding you so that by recalling them, look what it says now, you may fight the battle well. That God actually, it is part of how you fight the battle, that you're going to fight this battle well against the enemy, against your purpose, and against your family that he's attacking. How are you going to fight it? You better hold on to the word God has spoken over you. That's what he's saying. 
Timothy, you got to remind you of the prophetic word, the prophetic test. It may look like you're in a battle. It may look like he's winning, but you're going to fight well if you recall the word that, that God spoke into your life. Holding on to the faith and good conscience. But look what it says next. Which some have rejected, which means some let go of the word. Some didn't hold on to the word. They actually rejected and let go of the word and so have suffered shipwreck in regard to the faith. They didn't hold on to the word, so their faith got shipwrecked. And then he kind of names two of them. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. We learn about these other two characters who didn't hold on to the word of, uh, of God through the rest of the letters of, of Timothy. In his second letter, he kind of expands on these two characters a little bit more. Let me show it to you. I didn't put it in your notes because I did not have enough room, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, in the beginning of 2 Timothy chapter 4, that's where, that's where Paul's telling Timothy, for a time will come where men will not put up with sound doctrine. Do you remember this? They say they'll surround themselves with just people who just itch their ears, tell them what they, what they want to hear. And then he says later in that chapter, in verse 14, he says this, Alexander, remember that guy I told you about, Timothy, in the first letter, that Alexander one that I had to hand over who let go of the faith, he didn't hold on to the word. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he's done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed the message, the word of God. He let go somewhere along the way. And then look at uh, uh, a few verses later, or in chapter 2, verse 17 through 18, actually, it says this, their teaching, meaning their word, that they were teaching, they were proclaiming words. But be careful, he says, it's going to spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus, that's the other guy he mentioned in his first letter, and this new dude, Philetus, who have departed from the truth. You read the, the letter, you guys, of 2 Timothy, and what they were doing was confusing people about the resurrection. And about the standard of sin. They were saying what you do in the body is okay. And so they were teaching wrongly about sin. These guys were teaching a word that didn't line up with the word. Okay? So, so when, when you get a word, here's what you do. You submit that word. You hold on to that word. But number three, you got to test that word. That word that you got, that you received, must be tested. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21 says it like this. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Can I just speak to that sentence, that verse right there? Some of you treat prophecies, you know what that means, treat prophecies with contempt? It means you can't receive a word from God. You cannot receive a, 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 a rhema. It's hard to penetrate your heart. No, I just, I got the Bible. I got the Bible. That's what I need. I just need, I just need me and God. God says, do not treat the utterance of a word from God with contempt. God wants to speak to you directly. He wants to give you a word. He says, don't treat this with, with contempt. But here's what you do. You test it. You test them all. It should be tested. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 says, let two or three, three people prophesy and let others evaluate what is said. Well, how do we evaluate it? The word of God. The word of God is the standard. It is the truth. It tells us, it lets us know what's right and wrong, what's good, but what, it lets us know. It's the filter. Like, how do you know? How do we know the difference between murder and manslaughter? You know how we know? The Word of God told us. How do we know that lying is wrong? Because the Word of God told us. How do we know stealing is wrong? Because the Word of God tells us. The Word of God reveals to us. It is the standard of truth that we come back to, to which some people in our generation are saying, well, truth is evolving. No, it's not. Your understanding of truth is evolving, but God's word never changes. It is, it's the standard. Some people, and then there's other people who say, well, it's the law of the land. You just got to obey the law of the land. That's the standard. No, it ain't. Because there was a law just a while ago that the standard was that you could kill an unborn child before it was born, you know? That was the law of the land, which how ridiculous the law is, because the law actually said if you killed a mother who had a baby in her womb, you could be charged with double homicide. So the law of the land is not the standard. Culture is not the standard. Somebody's word or your word is not the standard. The word of God is the standard. And here's what's going to happen. Your word needs to be tested by the word. Let me say it like this. The word from God is always submitted to the God of the word. Your word from God is always submitted 
to the God of the Word. How do we evaluate the Word? We evaluate the Word, our Word, with the Word. So let me ask you a question. When you read something in the Word that you don't agree with or you don't currently believe, do you change your belief or do you try to change the Word? See, if you get a prophecy that doesn't line up with the Word of God, if you get a Word that doesn't line up with the Word of God, you better go with the Word of God. Let me show it to you, Deuteronomy chapter 13. It says, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and look what it says, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. Some people say, well, that's the test of a prophecy. It actually comes to pass. Well, no, not the whole test, because look what he says here. If there is a prophet or a dreamer, and he says something, and it actually comes to pass, look what it says next. But then he speaks. But then there's a word he has saying, let us go after other gods, which is against the Imra, the word of God, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of the prophet or the dreamer of dreams. You better listen to the written word of God. Look what it says next. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your so, in other words, if you get a prophecy that doesn't line up with the Word of God, you don't follow the prophecy, even if that prophecy is bearing fruit. There were actually two instances of two true prophets. They had names of the Bible written after them that gave a prophecy that didn't come to pass. I'll give you two of them. There, there's more, but I'll give you two of them. In, in Jeremiah chapter 35, God tells Jeremiah to go uh, prophesy to the Rechabites, and he gave him a word, prophesied to the Rechabites to go and drink wine. So he goes and tells them, Rechabites, the Lord says, go and drink wine. And the Rechabites, what it says is they rejected the word and they said, that word we will not obey because it does not line up with the word that God gave our fathers. And then God tells Jeremiah, go tell the Israelites and prophesy this. The Rechabites will, will, will are, are obeying the word I gave their fathers, and you Israelites have rejected the words I've given your father, so judgment is coming upon the nation of Israel. So what did, what did God do? God tells a true prophet to say something, but it was a test. It wasn't for fulfillment. It was actually for a test. See, and this is what the word, this is what I'm just trying to show you. The word that you get, it will be tested by the word, Okay? Here's, let me give you another, another instance um, with Jonah. God tells Jonah, go prophesy to Nineveh. Do you remember the prophetic word, what he was supposed to utter to Nineveh? He, he, Nineveh, in 40 days you will be destroyed. So let me ask you a question. Was Nineveh destroyed? No, it wasn't destroyed. It wasn't destroyed. The prophetic word was a test that they passed. They repented, and God spared them. It's actually why Jonah didn't even want to go in the first place. He goes, I knew you'd do it. I knew you'd have mercy on them. That's the reason why I would. I wasn't going to go say that word because I knew that you are going to forgive them anyway, God. So I have this dream, this word, this prophecy, but I also have the word that will test it until it's fulfillment. So let me ask you a question. How well do you know this book? How well do, do you know this word? Because it will test the word. I'm telling you, if, 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 because this, uh, this word, your word that you have, You'll get all confused about your word, your dream, your destiny if you don't know the word. Your dream won't come to pass if it doesn't line up with the word. God will test it and will continue to align it and correct it. If you know any man or woman of God who's done anything great for God, I promise you, you say, that's a man of God, that's a woman of God. Any man or woman of God done anything great for God, they had a devotion to the word of God. They were devoted to the word. Let me give you an example you, of, of how the word, the word, tests your word. You may have a different belief or practice about tithing, um, and that's, that's okay. But, but it, it, Jesus said himself in the New Testament, you ought to tithe. Okay, look. If there was nothing else said in the Bible except my Savior said, you ought to tithe, the, like the one who saved me, from addiction and from hopelessness and restored my mind and put me on a new life. The one, that's all I would need. That's, if, I, if there was nothing else about tithing, if it was just my Savior said, then that's it. Then I'm, 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 I'm going to do it. Um, it's in red, by the way, in your Bible. 
That's the red letters in, in your written Bible. I understand you may have a different view on it, but I'm just using this as an example because you have a dream from God. You got a word from God. And then the word says, we, we must honor the Lord with the first 10% of all of our income. Your word will continue to be tested by the word. And the fullness of God's dream and that word that you're holding on to, the fullness of its fulfillment will be determined by how much you align to this word. You, you can look at it differently. You can have a difference of opinion and, and stuff like that on it. I've been studying tithing for 20 years. I'm just saying this much is true, you guys. You need to honor God with your finances. This, this is the word. Okay, so what do we do when we get a word? Do we try to change it or are we going to let it change us? Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates, look what it says, even to the dividing of soul and spirit. My, my emotional part, my will where I get my will, and my spirit where I hear from God and connect with God. The word of God separates that part of me that wants to go my way, that has my feelings, that has my opinions, that has my thoughts, and then the part of me that knows what God wants me to do, what God to obey. That, part, that word of God separates those things. It reveals it. Look what it says. It's a revealer. It's a judge. The thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Your word will be tested by the word. This is the, pro this is the prophetic test. When you get a word from God, you're going to be tested by the word of God. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in your entire Bible. In the whole chapter, every verse is 176 verses. It's about the Bible. So the longest chapter in the Bible is about the Bible. I think God's trying to tell us something here about the priority of his word, the, the written word in our life. Psalm 119, 97 and 98 says this. Oh, how I love your word, God. I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. I wish I had time to talk to you about meditation and the power of meditation and what that is. Go back and I did a sermon last year in January, a rhythm of the word of God. It's in the rhythm series. Go to, I talk about meditation, okay? But he says, I, I meditate on your word all day long. And not only that, he says, your commands are always with me. I take it with me and they make me wiser than my enemies it's doing something transformative inside of me it's changing me and producing in me it's making me who i need to be to do what you've called me to do your word is doing that in me it's what changes me produces the wisdom and the character i need to do what you've called me to do your dream is subject to god's word the word must Submit and be tested by the word. So what should we do then? What do we do with the word? Okay, here, write this down. Number one, you got to love the word, the word of God. Now listen to me here. Please listen. Some of you love a word from God more than the word of God. Some of you love a word of God. You love to listen to sermons. You love to go to the conference and you travel around. You go to different worship experiences and watch stuff on, on YouTube and stuff. Uh, there's nothing, I mean, consume it. I'm good. Like, get it, get it. But some of you love a word more than you love the word, and you need to fall in love with the word of God. Your word must submit to the word of God. When you love, I'm talking about when you love something so much, you come to its defense. You know what I mean? Like when someone talks about your mama, you're like, hold up now. You ain't talking about my mama. Okay, like, because the word of God is being attacked so much. It's the attacked, most derided book in all of history for generations. And I want you to love this word. If you're gonna, if you're gonna pass the test, the prophetic test, you gotta love the word more than your word. Second Timothy chapter three says it like this. All now, this is again Paul talking to Timothy because there's all this people letting go of the word, and there's this false doctrine spreading, and he goes. Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Timothy, everyone's got a word. Everyone's teaching something. But what you need to know, Timothy, is that this word, the written word, this is what's useful for teaching. This is what's useful for rebuking. This is what's useful for correcting. Don't use a word. Timothy, use the word. This is your word. And then why? Look what it says. Why? So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 
The good work that God planned in advance for you to do, that's what he's talking about here. There is a good work. There is a dream to destiny. What's going to equip you to do what God has called you to do, giving you a word to do? The word of God is going to equip, correct, align, and put you in the place to fulfill your destiny. Well, I'm preaching so much better than you're responding. Northwest is shouting me down, though. I know it. I can sense it. Northwest is like, hallelujah. Amen. I love the word of God. I love the word of God. What is your attitude toward the word? Because your attitude towards it determines what you receive from it. Okay? Here's what Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 says. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. He's talking about these Jews that rejected the gospel. But the message they heard was of no value to them. It was the same word. Listen to me. It was the same word, the same rhema, the same debar, the same spoken revelation of word. It had no value because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. So, so you can't just read it. You got to believe it. Okay? When I combine this word with my faith, I don't, I don't just read it. I believe what God said. I am. I am. What he said I can do, I'm going to do. Where he said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. What he says, I'm going to operate by that by faith. I'm going. That's what adds power to the word of God, value to the word of God. Faith, faith. I got I to gotta love the word of God. I mean, you guys, if there was one thing, if you narrow it down to one thing, you say, Pastor, what's the one thing you want? Like I would say, fall in love with the word of God. If you just tell me one thing for you, like fall in love with the word of God. Love the word. Number two, here's what we need to do because it's, it's going to test your word. Love it, but then learn it. Learn the word of God. And when I say that, this, what I mean is, is here's listen to the word of God. I'm glad I, we archive our sermons. We uh, listen to the word is the next fill in there. Listen to the word. They're, we archive them. We, we put them online. There's other great Bible teachers that you're like, go ahead, grab the word of God. Uh, sound Bible teachers, Matthew 7, 24 says, therefore, everyone who hears these words, Jesus speaking, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So tests are happening to every one of us but not every one of us are responding to the test the same way. The storms of this life are happening to every one of us, but everyone's responding to the storm differently. You know what's making us respond to the testing of God differently is what's your foundation. How you respond to the tests of God is determined by what you're putting your foundation in. Built on the rock. Listen, listen to the word of God. Read the word of God. Read it. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, Jesus said, it's written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So let me get really practical with you. Get a paper Bible. If you don't have a paper Bible, go get one. I'm all for like apps and stuff like that. And like, I, I have you version. It's great. I'm on you version. I have devotions I'm following. But there's something different about, about having a paper Bible, because when you have a paper Bible, it's, you can see the, the word, the dream that God's book, you see it in the in, in indentation. When you're, when you're reading it, you can see the note. And I mean, sure, that, I don't know if you, you guys know how to do that really good on your apps. Fine. But I mean, like, I, I may not know where Romans 8, 1 is in every Bible, but I know it's in the left inseam in my Bible. Do you know what I'm saying? Okay. That, that's, I, you got you to gotta listen and read the word. Get a paper Bible. And then set aside some time to read it. Like, actually set aside in your calendar. For me, it's the morning. I set the morning. Before I do anything, I get a cup of coffee or my pre-workout drink. You know what I'm saying? And I'm a drink. I'm a, whatever that, like I'm a drink that, whatever it is in that morning, whatever day it is, it's either coffee or the pre-workout. And I'm going to spend some time with God in my word. I'm going to set it aside. It's morning. That's what it is for me. Okay? Have, have a Bible reading plan. Don't just open up your Bible and be like, okay, God, what are you going to say to me today? No. Have a plan. We're going to go through the entire word. Don't just read the parts of the Bible that you like and you're comfortable with. Get the entire word. I always encourage people to, to do the one-year Bible reading plan. If, you have, if you're on version, you can follow Discovery Church. We have the one-year Bible reading plan on our version, And on our website, we're actually going to be putting Bible reading plans and stuff like that coming soon. But grab a Bible reading plan that you're systematically going through the word of God. And then when you do, don't just read the Bible, but let the Bible read you. 
This is one of the biggest issues I see with people. People read the Bible to just read the Bible. That's the purpose. Like, I'm going to read the Bible because I want to read the Bible in a year. I read the Bible because I want to do that. I check out my box. No, you don't read the Bible to read the Bible. You read the Bible to let it read you. You say, God, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me today? So we got to listen to it. we got to read it. Thirdly, study it. Oh, you can go deeper. You can go deeper in this thing. You can actually study. You can get yourself some, some commentary, some Bible study, some study Bibles. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. In the English Standard Version, that's what that ESV says there. That's what that means there, English Standard Version. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. That word approved means tested. A worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of of truth. That's where to be our, do, do, our, do your best to rightly handle the word of truth. Let me, let me show you the same verse in a different translation in the Amplified Classic Version, which I love. I love all kinds of versions of the Bible, but the Amplified Version, what that does, because the Hebrew and the Greek language is so vast, sometimes just giving one word doesn't do it justice. So what the Amplified does is it gives you multiple words for the one English word that that word actually means. So let me show it to you. That same, that same verse says this in the Amplified. Study And be eager to do your utmost to present yourself to God approved. And it translates it, tested by trial. A workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. You guys, you got to, there is so much more you can get from your word. There is so much more you can get from it. So don't just listen to it and read it. Study rightly divide your word. We have this course here at Discovery, a small group called Foundations. If you've never been, I encourage you to go to Foundations. We have level one, level two, level three. Level one is for new believers. Level two is for growing believers. Level three is for mature believers. And we teach you and teach people how to interpret and read the word of God. So important that you would know. Like one of the things that we teach in this class, I'll just teach it here real quick, is the Bible translations. So, so many people that we get asked, like, what's a good translation? I got a, I got a chart that I want to show you real quick, this chart of Bible translations. Some people think like, oh, like there's got to be like the word for word translations. Those are the ones I need. I need the word for word on this side, the word for word translation, because that's the one that's going to be more true to the Bible. Well, not exactly, not entirely, because... The word in Hebrew and Greek are so vast and complex. One English word does not do it justice all the time. So we have these thought for thought versions that actually take the thought, the meaning, the intention, and the purpose that God was intending to say through the word, and they stay true to that. So, so there's actually value in having thought for thought. So here's what I encourage people. In the middle, find yourself a reading Bible. NIV or NL, NLT are good ones. And I mean, that's your reading Bible. But then when you're studying the word of God, grab some word for word, grab some thought for thought, study the word of God. So let me give you an, an example, because depending on like that Greek or Hebrew word, depending on like the, ver- the verb or its tense, its tone and language, depending on that, all that, it could change the whole meaning of the verse. For instance, me and my family, Wednesday and Thursday, we went to Ventura Beach. We went to the beach. When you guys were sweating like crazy the first hot day, we were like, we're out of this mug, dude. So, so let me give you 1 Jason chapter 3, verse 14. 1 Jason chapter 3, verse 14 says he went to the beach to get some sun. Okay? That's what happened. But, but hold on. Get some. What verb, tense, and tone was used for get some? Well, depending on what verb, tense, and language, and tone was used, it could mean he went to the beach to quietly sit and soak in the sun. How many of you want some of that? Come on now. Some be- or, wait a second, but depending on the verb, tense, and tone, it might, it might be translated, he went to the beach to actively pursue and take hold of the sun. So was it get some or get some? Do, do you see how like it's a study of the Word of God can make it come much more alive if you actually knew some, some deeper intention of language and meaning? That's why you got to study the Word. And why do we study it, by the way? Why do we study it? So we could be smart? No, that's what the Pharisees did, you guys. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 39, 
You search the scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life. They know the scriptures were meant to point to me, Jesus said. Here's the whole purpose. The scriptures were meant to point to me so I could be a shepherd in your life and lead you by my voice that you would know. By knowing the word, you could know my word. Here's the purpose of the scripture, man. So that when you get a word, you don't listen to a stranger's voice. You're soaked in that word and you're able to, to hear the voice of the shepherd amidst it. Come on, are you hearing me, you guys? This is the prophetic test that every one of us will, will go through and go on. We gotta, I want you to love the word, learn the word. And number three, I want you to live it. Live the word of God. It's not enough to just learn it and read it. We've got to live it. Not in your notes, but in Ephesians chapter 6, we see it listed in that Ephesians chapter 6 is the armor of God chapter. All the different tools that God has given us to take our stand against the the schemes and strategies of the enemy. You know the one piece of equipment on the armor, only one is the offensive weapon that we are to use offensively to inflict damage to the enemy is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This, this is the only, we do not wage war like the rest of this world. We do not fight like the world fights. We don't fight flesh and blood. This is how well do you know do you love it? Do, 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 are you learning it? Do you study it? Are, are, you, are you living this? Because your word, the word God has spoken over your life will be tested, refined by the word. And back to Psalm 119, the whole chapter remembers about the word of God. Here's another few verses from it. It says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? How do we do it, man? It's hard living in this world and this culture. Here's what he says, by living, not by just listening, not by just like read, no, 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 by living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. How? How do we stay on the path? I have hidden your word in my heart. Man, I tucked it away. I'm not going to let this get stolen, robbed. I'm going to protect this thing. I'm going to hide this thing in my heart that I might not sin, that I might not get distracted, that I might not go astray and sin against you. we got to live this word. Hide it in our heart. Here, I'm going to do something, before we pray, I'm going to do something I've, I've never done with us in our service ever before. We're together, we're going to hide the word of God in our heart. We're going to memorize a verse together, okay? Okay, here's what, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you the verse on the screen. We're going to read it a few times together. Wherever you're at, outdoor, online, in Northwest, we're going to read it out loud together a couple times. And then we're going to go through this. And event, you're, going to get to read, you're going to do it by memory in just a few moments. Let me show it to you. It's Psalm 119, 105. And here's what I want to do. I want us all with our speaking voice. You don't need to scream it or anything like that. Just with your normal speaking voice, let's say this out loud together, okay? One, two, three. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, 105. One more time. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 105. Now, let me take that away and just put the first letters up. Okay? Do it again. Here we go. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm. Take it all off. Ready? Your word. Psalm 105. Come on, give yourself a hand, you guys. Come on. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.